My name is Amy Wise. I'm the director of the UT Humanity Center. I'm really glad you're here today. We are also live streaming this session onto YouTube, so we might have questions coming from both the floor and from cyberspace today. Um, this is part of the UT Humanity Center's Distinguished Lecture Series. And this is a series we run every year to bring in some of the most renowned scholars in nine different departments, um, in both humanities and arts, to UT um, to give us a sense of what's happening in the world of the arts and humanities, but also to questions among UT professors and regional entities. For instance, this lecture that you're at today is a collaboration between the University of Tennessee and the Knoxville Museum of Art. And I really hope that you go to the Knoxville Museum of Art to see their Global Asians exhibit, which will run until through April 22nd. And this talk today is partially based on that exhibition. Um, it's, I also wanted to, do while I have the mic, um, to let you know that next week, the Humanity Center will be sponsoring uh, Black Ecologies Week with a number of UTK de um, departmental partners, as well as regional partners. You should see posters for that online, as well as on our social media page. And this is a joint effort among us to present new scholarly research on Black culture and environmentalism. So I hope you can join us for those events as well. It's my pleasure today to introduce our panelists and our keynote speaker. Um, our keynote is Professor Chang Ten, who is Assistant Professor of Art History and Asian Studies at Pennsylvania State University. Dr. Ten specializes in Chinese and East Asian art in the 20th and 21st century. Her research interests include global modernism and avant-gardism, theories and practices of public and public and socially engaged art, art and eco-criticism, inter-Asian connections between artists and art collectives, and the history of collecting and exhibiting of Asian and Asian American art in the United States. It's really hard to do this with a mask on. <laughs> um, her um, upcoming monograph examines contemporary Chinese artists turn to the non-elite and marginalized sectors of the public and argues that such a turn enables them to craft a peripheral avant-gardism and to intervene in the sphere of local as well as global politics. Dr. Chan has published in peer-reviewed journals such as the Art, such as Art Journal, World Art, Third Text, um, Positions, Diacritics, and Asia Critique. And she currently serves on the editorial board of the Journal of Contemporary Chinese Art, as well as the board of Verge Studies in Global Asia. In addition to other level courses on modern and contemporary Chinese and Asian art, Dr. Tian also teaches survey courses as well as graduate seminars on art history and Asian studies. But to our great advantage and delight, she's also serving as curator for the art exhibition at the National Museum of Art titled Global Asia's. Contemporary Asian and Asian American Art from the Collections of the Jordan D. Schnitzer and His Family Foundation. And this will run again. Uh, again, we'll run through April 22nd. I hope that you have a chance to go to the KMA again and see this uh, just astounding exhibition. Our other three panelists are from the University of Tennessee, uh, University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Our first uh, speaker will be Suzanne Wright, who is Associate Professor of Art History and whose specialization is the visual culture of late imperial China, particularly paintings and prints. Her recent research has focused on woodblock prints of the late Ming and early Qing period, though she's equally interested in painting of other periods. Prior to, sorry, painting of the period, not painting of other periods. <laughs> Prior to pursuing her doctorate, she's assistant curator of Far Eastern Art at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and she also curated Gardens, Art, and Commerce in Chinese Woodblock Prints, which was an exhibition of Chinese woodblock prints for the Huntington Library. Uh, <clears throat> she co-wrote the accompanying full illustrated catalog. She has published articles on 17th century catalogs of letter paper designs, the curated biography of a Chinese publisher, and the history of paper decorations for a volume on Chinese epistolary culture. Her essays, on the distinctive formal language of pet letter papers and its use in illustrative literature 
and also in performative aspects of Chinese woodblock printed playing cards for drinking games. <laughs> That's great. Um, will appear in two forthcoming conference volumes. Our second panelist is Noriko Horiguchi, Associate Professor of Japanese in the UTK Department of Modern Foreign Languages and Literatures. A native of Japan, Dr. Horiguchi originally took a position at UT in 2002. She studies and teaches extensively on Japan's literary body, both before and after the end of World War II in 1945. In 2002, Dr. Horiguchi's book, Women Adrift, The Literature of Japan's Imperial Body, was published by the University of Minnesota Press. Her articles and book chapters have appeared in such journals as US Japan, Women's Journal, and RIM. And she has been the recipient of the Japan Foundation Research Fellowship, it's a visiting scholarship at Kyoto University, so a visiting associate people. professor, professorship at Kobo <laughs> University, and other visiting professorships in Japan. Her current project, currently under press review, is titled Devouring Empire, Food Narratives and Memories in Modern Japan. And our third, no, I did to get it out of order, I'm sorry. <laughs> Actually, it's our second panelist, um, is Rachel Scott, who is Associate Professor of Religious Studies at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Dr. Scott studies the history of Theravedic Buddhism in South and Southeast Asia, with an emphasis on contemporary Buddhism in Thailand. Her first book, Nirvana for Sale, Buddhism, Wealth, and the Dhammakaya Temple examined contemporary debates over monastic and lay wealth in Thailand. Her work has appeared in the Oxford Handbook of Contemporary Buddhism and numerous edited collections. Her current research focus focuses on stories of powerful female aesthetics and spirits, the impact of new media on religious authority and community, and the role of the Buddhist Sangha in global Buddhism. So with great pleasure, after <laughs> that long introduction, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker today, Jane Tan. breathtaking but <laughs> all right so it's my great pleasure to be here today and I want to of course give my special and heartfelt thanks to the people who invited me here um, Bobe and Amy and people at the KMA Museum um, Stephen David and Elena who made my trip to this exciting city possible and also um, really provided the best company I could hope for in my <laughs> two days here. And of course, I'm very grateful to um, other colleagues here, like Koichi, thank you for being here, and everyone who at the panel today to contribute your expertise to the discussion and um, the great graduate students I've met as well. So a round of thanks. All right, so I yesterday I already gave a talk at KMA about the exhibition in which we um, took a close look at some of the artworks. So my talk today will continue to focus on the artworks in the exhibition, which is of course the reason why all of us are here. But I will discuss more about the historical context and the broader implications of some of these works. So I will talk a little bit about the process and rationale of my curatorship in relation to how Asian and Asian American art has been received and interpreted in the United States. Then I will select a few works for some detailed analysis. So after my work, you know, which will take about 40, I mean, after my talk, which will last about 40 minutes and my three distinguished colleagues here will share their own thoughts and expertise that are in one way or the other related to the idea of global Asia, which I would argue refers to not only the positioning of Asia in a global context, but also to the reconceptualization of Asia as a plural, hybrid, and imagined entity that circulates and transforms across time and space. 
So three years ago, my colleagues at the Palmer Museum of Art, Erin Coe and Joyce Robinson, introduced me to the wonderful collection of Asian and Asian American art at the Jordan Chinese Foundation, which had a few hundred works from dozens of artists of Asian ancestry and asked if I could make an exhibition out of them. It was not difficult for me to find works of interest and some common themes. However, I was wrestling with two questions from the very beginning. One, what is the rationale of grouping those artists of drastically different styles and backgrounds together, aside from the rather gratuitous fact that they share the so-called Asian ancestry, which is extremely wide-ranging and in many ways a problematic concept with Asian identity. Secondly, I wonder, can this exhibition possibly modify our conventional understandings of modern and American art beyond the marginal expansion of its territory? In other words, do the presence of minority art quote unquote minority art, merely adding a footnote to the story of the avant-garde, which is essentially Eurocentric, or does it disrupt or change the story in some way? During the years of pandemic, of the pandemic Black Lives, Black, Black Lives Matter movement and increasing incidents of anti-Asian racism, these questions became even more urgent to me because I wanted to combat the deeply ingrained notion that all Asians are alike and somehow foreign, and the assumption that they had to either be assimilated to become a part of American society or to remain insular and unchanging in order to protect their own identities. These concerns, I think, is also tied to the history of art and experiences of artists. Asia has a very long history of making art, as many of us know, going back to the Neolithic times, and Asian objects began to be collected and exhibited as art in America in the early 20th century. This is one of the earliest exhibitions where Asian objects were seen as fine art instead of just antiques or you know, objects of interest anthropological objects. And Asian Americans who began to arrive at North America in the mid 19th century were also making wonderfully innovative works that were selling well and earning awards by the early 20th century. However, for almost the entire 20th century, the works by modern Asian and Asian American artists of modern as that's a word I should stress here. The works by modern Asian and Asian American artists barely made it into art history. The reasons are manifold. One is obviously racism that was exemplified by the Chinese Exclusion Act that was passed in 1882 and lasted basically until the civil rights movement. And then the Cold War mentality that saw Asia as either allies or enemy and or um, the kind of the concentration, the overt focus on New York as epicenter of American modernism, while the West Coast and the rest of the country were somewhat overlooked. On top of all that, there was this strange but pervasive double standard. If a you know Asian artist adopts experimental methods and question techniques, such as the one on the right you see here, you know, Fujioka, then um, <clears throat> she's seen as inauthentic and derivative. If an artist uses the traditionally Asian iconography or media, like the one on the left that you're seeing, Oiki, <clears throat> then he's seen, he's appreciated for being exotic, but also marginalized as being conservative or backward. So it's a loose, loose situation for these artists. In the 1990s, with the increasing globalization of art and landmark exhibitions like this, the tide was turning. But still, 
Asian and Asian American artists often have to struggle with their identity in the so-called global art world because there is still this expectation for them to be Asian in some way while also being modern and global. And the weird idea that the two sides of the nation and be modern and global are somewhat at odds with each other. <clears throat> Patty Warashina's Lotus Float, which I chose to be the title image of the exhibition catalog, shows this tension and ambiguity very well. As a Washington-born and educated artist, she's primarily a sculptor with ceramics. In close connection with the funk art movement in California, her sculptures are whimsical, provocative, and politically poignant. One would not be able to tell that she was taught by the likes of Hamada Shoji, a leader of the Ming Dai movement that was dominant in the field of ceramics in the mid-century in the US and even today to some degree. Apparently, she rebelled against the ostensibly Japanese aesthetics of, his, of her teachers and went her own way. This print, a medium she started using in the 2000s, picks on the re-envisions picks on and re-envisions the Asian identity she rejects. The image is situated in the Lotus Pond, a favorite feature in the gardens of Asia and now globally, we all love Lotus Pond, well tended, <clears throat> and a fixture of Warashina's own garden. She sent this image to me, and she's a very charming old lady who cultivates her garden quite a bit. And um, however, the pond in the print looks deserted and bleak, and the lotus leaves, bloody red and jack, look ominous as if they were going to bite. The submarine lurking at the right corner, okay, it's a submarine, actually, she told me that as well, camouflages itself as a lotus leaf deepening the sense of violence and hidden threat, which Warashina said reflected how she felt about the world at the time. The nude figure in a stiff, improbable pose and the enigmatic, trance expression seems like either a deity or a corpse. But she's actually a somewhat nightmarish self-portrait of Warashina. She said that the shabby hair very much her, but she said the figure is a lot skinnier than she is, which is what artist is entitled to do, to lose a few pounds in her self-portraits. And so, um, remarkably, the figure is bright yellow, a pigment Warashina seldom uses for her nude figures. And this bright yellow is the crescent of white on her face. So she looks like a banana, slightly peeled which is a cliche metaphor for Asian Americans that, you know, you're yellow outside and white right inside. Several Asian tropes are cited and subtly inverted here and mixed with global as well as individual anxieties and visions, creating a tension that is acutely felt but never fully articulated. The artworks I chose for this exhibition, I think, all share this ambiguity and tension in their individual ways. They're not meant to show what Asian or Asian American art really is, but what it can be, how it can reinvent itself in its own time and space, and how it may interact with other ideas, styles, and materials across the globe. For that reason, I borrowed the title Global Asia's, which was actually something um, my colleagues at Penn State have created. It's a, Cross top institutions and conferences and panels that explore this plural idea about what Asia is. I borrowed this title, Global Asia, to emphasize art's imaginative power to reshape the contours of Asia in our mind, to stress its plural, cosmopolitan, and subtly subversive aspects. With these intentions in mind, 
I divide the exhibition into three sections. The first, exuberant forms, introduces works that challenge and enrich the mainstream narrative of abstract art in the US. The second, moving stories, remaps the identities of the artists by their migratory trajectories rather than by national or ethnic boundaries. The third section, Asia's Reinvented, shows how the so-called Asian heritages are repackaged and remixed to offer insights on global trends such as consumerism and climate change. The first work I want to discuss is June Kaneko, untitled Raku Voslav. Kaneko was born and trained in Japan and has worked in Nebraska for decades. This work, with its primal luminous colors and explosive centrifugal motion, evokes the aesthetics of abstract expressionism, which emphasizes the materiality of the paint and the physical forces that was behind its creation. This type of art was explored by artists in the US, Europe, and Japan during the post-war era. And the American portion in particular became a canon of modern art. The process Kaneko uses to create his ceramics were equally material and action-based but less expressive and human-centered. Rakuware, one of the oldest peons of Japan, was characterized by hand-shaped clay and poured, dipped, and brushed on colors that blend and flow in the firing process. So the result both reflected the potter's touch and the uncontrolled material formations. More importantly, unlike a typical abstract expressionist painting, Kaneko's wood slab is very modest in scale. He actually specified that he wanted those pieces to be no bigger than a large dinner platter. So quote, no bigger than a large dinner platter. So rather than something that is public and monumental, which is actually his line of specialty, he does these very large outdoor installations, and you know, they're called dongles. And so basically, his main line of specialty is doing very large public artworks. But he wants his engagement of abstract expressionism here to be domestic and utilitarian. I would argue that this emphasis on scale and by extension on domesticity and utility is a deliberate gesture against the gender and racialized discourse of modern American art. As scholars such as Bert Winter Tamarki and Chris Reed have argued, American abstract expressionism was influenced by Asian art such as calligraphy and ink painting, like Franz Kling and Mark Toby are the most obvious examples actually learned you know, calligraphy from East Asia. <laughs> but such influences were dismissed by major critics like, Kling, like Clement Greenberg as unimportant, minor, because such aesthetics, and I'm quoting here, exemplifies the, um, it's because this kind of art is, and I quote, passive, decorative, reticent, precious, well-mannered. End of quote. While Jackson Pollock exemplifies, and here the quote again, the nativeness, the Americanness of violence, exasperation, and stridency. End of quote. In other words, Asian aesthetics or Asian influenced aesthetics was deemed feminine, domestic, and hence incompatible with the many Americanness, which characterized the post-war modern art scene. What Raku War's lab does is to reassert the power of the once marginalized Asian decorativeness into its proper place in art history and to contest the notion that Americanness is by definition violent and masculine. 
Huang Yang Chun's aggregation is another idiosyncratic and subtly subversive reaction to abstract expressionism. Chun came to Philadelphia to study art in the 1960s from Korea, and by his own account, fell in love with abstract expressionism immediately. The kind of abstract expressionism he loved was perhaps that of Jens Martin and Robert Wyman type, which is monochromatic and involves repetitive long-term physical labor. In fact, South Korean artists were engaged with similar ex experiments. Oh, it's still the same page, like what you see right here on the left. Um, similar experiments at the time, producing a group of works that are called which means monochromatic painting, that was discussed in Jane Key's excellent book, Contemporary Korean Art, Tan Se Kwa and, and the Urgency of Method in 2013. Chun's creation of aggregation involves a long process in which he collected, with assistance of course, thousands of these label packages that you can see on the detail on the right top corner, <laughs> label packages made with pages from old books or newspapers and used to wrap herbal medicines in East Asian apothecaries and gluing them to a demarcated surface. The results are these jacked, irregular, tactile surfaces on which fragments of writing are still partially visible but no longer readable. Divided in horizontal bands like this, they look like fossils in stratified rocks. What these work commemorates are layers of time. The geographic time, which is metaphorically referred to in these aggregated rock like formations, historical time, which is archived in those no longer readable words, and personal time, which reflects um, Chun's memories as a sickly child who had to take a lot of these herbal medicines, and the time of making itself, which demands patient, somewhat repetitive labor that stands in sharp contrast with the spontaneous, expressive labor that you would expect from a so-called genius artist. It is, again, an artwork that is modest in scale but rich in connotations. Like several other works in the first section that I don't have time to describe in detail here, the works in the exuberant forms highlight the art of craftsmanship and manual labor, the sort of work that remains undervalued today in both art and society at large. Moving stories, the second section could be described, could be considered the core in global Asia, because it is a common characteristic, it's, it is the common characteristics of all the 15 featured artists who were born in the United States, China, Korea, Japan, and Argentina, but have one thing in common: they have moved across borders and, in some cases, been moved to places involuntarily. And the experiences of migration helped shape their art. I will start with a self-portrait of Roger Shimomura, a third-generation Japanese art of Japanese American who served in the U.S. Army in the 1960s. The portrait, when we compare it to his actual photo of an older age, of course, captures some of the key features of him, such as the shape of face and eyebrows. But the painting. But the painting looks ominous and suspicious due to a number of reasons, factors. The dark background and the heavy shadows cast on Shimomura's face and body reminds us of the shadow figures in noir films, which reflects the Cold War fear of espionage and hidden threat. The facial expression <clears throat> subtly but unmistakably mimics the notorious figure of Mr. I.Y. Miyoshi from Red at Tiffany's, 
which was described by contemporaneous news media as, and I quote, the myopic, obtuse Japanese. <clears throat> and the journalist Jeff Young has called Mr. Yunyoshi the godfather of all the Chinchan stereotypes. But the caricature, <clears throat> but the caricature the, the appearance was probably also derived from even more sinister captures of the Japanese during World War II, which Shimamura also parodied in his later paintings. There's another painting by Shimamura that you know she really pairs his, I mean he really pairs his face together with one of these caricatured demonized Japanese faces and you see if there's actually any similarities between them. <clears throat> so um also, the painting portrays an Asian person as an American soldier, which, which we rarely ever see in a mainstream visual culture. On the contrary, Asian faces, Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese, and now Chinese have been frequently pictured as the enemy in the US throughout the 20th century. Shimamura and his family were victims of this prejudice. After Pearl Harbor, they were sent to Minidoka internment camp in Idaho, along with over 110,000 Japanese Americans. Shimamura was three years old at the time, and this print depicts the great injustice innocent men, women, and children suffered at the time <clears throat> for no reason other than their ethnicity and physical appearance. As this poem, by also by Shimamura, <clears throat> evocatively describes because their American eyes are a slant, they were grouped together with the kamikaze pilots. This perception that the Asian person could not be an American soldier persists to the 21st century. In 2011, the 19 year old Chinese American soldier Danny Chen was driven to suicide by the bullies and racist attacks of his peers in the, in the army. It was actually a hate crime that, you know, eight soldiers were put martial. And the tragedy was made into an opera in 2018, also entitled An American Soldier. No doubt, Shimamura was subject to prejudice and discrimination when he served in the army himself. His reflection of it, however, was not outright condemnation, but subtle but poignant mockery. Many of the migrating stories, however, are more hopeful. Hong Leo was one such example of upward transformations. So she, you know, unfortunately she died the last year, she passed away, and um, right before a major exhibition of hers was about to open in the National Portrait Gallery. So in the three portraits of hers that are in Global Asia's exhibition, she looked like three different women, from a frowning, dark-skinned proletarian to a pensive immigrant with a scarf around her head, and finally a proud citizen with a bright, open face and a raised chin. These changes reflect what she went through in her life, from a forced laborer in Mao's China to a new life in the U.S. after, he met, he, after she emigrated in the 1980s. Another interesting detail in these paintings are the photocopied IDs added at the corners. And you can see them in these paintings, and these are the larger, <clears throat> enlarged versions of them, which look deceptively real, but upon close examination were fabricated. You know, the stamps and the words and the dates, they don't match. It's like a, a bunch of signs, official documents mixed together. <clears throat> the ID photos, which are meant to verify the identity of the portrait person, here are used to question the authenticity of any portraits, suggesting that one's identity not only fluctuates over time and space, but also shifts with modes of representation. Leo captures such ambiguity of ID photos in her first known work <clears throat> since she um, came to the US 
which is the enlarged and modified painting of her recently acquired green card with the fingerprint, mangled strips, and signed cookie fortune, as well as her real signature in Chinese. The perceptions of her as an Asian person and her self-perception seem intimately but confusingly intertwined. This idea of migrating and multifaceted identities illustrated in a conceptual way in Rokri Kiravania's work in Global Asia, which I would also call a self-portrait, even though it does not look like one. A child of diplomats, Kiravania was born in Argentina, grew up in Ethiopia, Canada, and Thailand, then studied art in Chicago and moved to New York City after graduation. He was best known for his untitled free performances for which he made delicious Thai curries for museums and gallery visitors across the world. The spontaneous conversations people would then have over the meal is the content of his work, which is labeled relational art. This act of radical sociability was partially motivated by his questions about objects and identity. So that was the questions he had when he was in graduate school, and that he, you know, kind of tried to um, restore life to what you speak. Motivated by his question about objects and identity, he felt that art needs to be infused with life, which is how they were conceived in pre-modern societies, as well as uh, in many non-Western societies today. Untitled, the map of the land of feelings which consists of three long scrolls, is also a way he turns the intimate details of his own life into art. The center band is made of photocopies of the many pages of his passport, which is a forensic portrayal of the self as it moved across borders. He then added numerous other images and texts that he used, encountered, made, or imagined in his journeys including city maps, archaeological and architecture sites, mazes, time zones, illustrations of urban flow, notebook pages, diaries, pictures of artwork encounter, and recipes of his famous curry, which I encourage all of you to go search for when you visit the museum. They were bookended by two artworks that are most influential for him, Marcel Food Tires, Casserole and Closed Muscles, and Marcel Duchamp's Fountain, two crucial works of 20th century art that dared to turn the most modern objects into art. The figure of Marcel Duchamp will guide us to the next section, Asia's Reinvented, in which another artist of Asian origin was also profoundly influenced by Duchamp. Murakami's is one of the, you know, Takashi Murakami is one of the best known artists in the 21st century, in the early 21st century. His super flat museum is made of small cardboard boxes, each contains 10 plastic miniatures of his best known works to be sold in museum shops as well as convenience stores. The work is an unmistakable homage to Yushan's box in a suitcase in, that he created in 1935 and 1941, for which he packs a bunch of reproductions of his own works and carries them around in a suitcase like a salesman. Both works advocate a radically democratizing idea for art, but also suggest that art is inseparable from commerce, a lesson Duchamp played with, but Murakami took to heart. Sometimes called the Japanese, you know, the Jeff Koons of Japan, Yurikami is more comfortable with the commercial side of art than most artists do. He has designed for Louis Vuitton, made album covers for Kanye West, and sold his own design, sold his own designs together with fake LV bags in the Brooklyn Museum. That's the one, that's a performance piece at, at the lower left corner. The commercial appeal of his work comes from his mastery of the kawaii, the Japanese pop culture's obsession with cuteness, as well as his ability to push 
such cuteness to the edge of being creepy. This is amply reflected in his famous Mr. Dog, who is like a Mickey Mouse with sharp teeth and multiple eyes, and his grinning flowers, which are so relentlessly cheerful that they look scary. He describes this kind of aesthetics as super flat, which plays <clears throat> which plays with the modernist obsession with a flattened pictorial space and all over composition, which is used to describe Jackson Pollock's paintings, as well as the commercial culture's lack of depth. <clears throat> Mariko Mori's Star Doll, which is also another piece included in the exhibition, is based on the artist's earlier performance of a pop star is also a reflection of these super flat aesthetics. So it's like this complete, you know, superficiality of a person without a depth. It is also a depiction of the infantization and objectif objectification of women, which is a serious problem in Japan, but also much beyond Japan. Mm -hmm. Mirikami's Wink, which, is, which was commissioned as a sort of artistic holiday present by the Peter Norton Family Christmas Project in 2000, uses two of his most recognizable icons, Miss Dog and the Flowers. This little toy also references to the popular Buddhist icon, Budai or Hadei, which usually sits in a kind of meditation pose, is always laughing, and supposedly brings good fortune. Even the multiple eyes may refer to the third eye of the Buddha. However, the reference here seems more like a mockery of the rampant commercialization of Buddhism than an homage to the religion. Like many of Murakami's works, it looks cute, festive, but at the same time creepy and fake. Murakami's of Chinese lines Pianis, skulls, and fountains again combines cute and creepy, but it is a more complex work. Murakami has a PhD in Nihonga, Japanese style paintings, and this print shows off his familiarity and virtuosity in various forms of traditional Japanese art. First, the background, which looks partially silk screened, silk screened and partially like oxidate, oxidated metal was created by Tarashikomi, a technique that can be traced to the 7th century and most famously practiced and perfected by the Rinpa school of, of the 17th century. The Chinese line, a popular symbol across East Asia, is painted here with a variety of dexterous brush methods, the sort of skills possessed by the elite literati school of painters. The sprouting waterfalls and the gracefully arched bridge are both among the most recognizable icons of Japanese art, especially for a Western audience due to the popularity of ukiyo-e and its influence on modern artists such as Monet. However, all these beautiful references are rendered somewhat morbid and absurd here with the bridge made of skulls and the line looking drunk or at least loopy. In fact, the whole image should be interpreted as a scene of death or even hell. So in popular East Asian cosmo cosmology that was partially informed by Buddhism, when one dies, one goes to the yellow spring, walks across the bridge to the wheel of reincarnation. And the golden line probably stands for the Bodhisattva Romaji, which in Chinese is Ditangwang, a guardian of afterlife who vows that he would not achieve nirvana until the hells are empty. Here, this scene <clears throat> alludes to the catastrophe after the nuclear bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, a topic Murakami has returned to again and again in his artistic career. So he has named a lot of his works and exhibitions, The Little Boy and Fat Man. And you can see like this one, two little toys they were holding. They're 
respectively named Little Boy and Fat Man, and they were holding these skulls that were similar to the skull seen in the print. <clears throat> Here, yeah. So, um, so he often, you know, alludes to these catastrophes, but with sardonic humor. Another indication to the catastrophe is the inscription here, at high circle, which reads, grass, trees, and national soil or land all turned into Buddha, which is a euphemism for death. Seen in this light, the metallic dripping background brings to mind the scorched earth where death reigns supreme. I want to end the talk with another work by a Japanese artist who also visualizes disasters in a subtle but provocative visual language. Manabu Ikeda was born and educated in Japan but has lived and worked in Madison, Wisconsin for years. In 2011, he traveled back to Japan to study and portray the Fukushima Daiichi accident, <clears throat> one of the worst natural and man-made disasters in human history. The print shows the collapsing of a nuclear plant. This is the print he made after field research near the site of the nuclear meltdown. <clears throat> shows the collapsing of a nuclear power plant in painstaking detail. And so I said, the amount of pipes are just mind boggling. And the whole scene is set on a diamond shaped boulder, the tip of which is turning into ice, which underscores the fact that the sophisticated, powerful infrastructure we, we rely on today actually rests on very fragile basis. In Iceberg, we see the diamond-shaped iceberg again in a disaster scenario, but it is disarmingly elegant and strange. The iceberg is upside down and utterly groundless. It seems to float in outer space and the airplane at the bottom adds to the sense of disorientation. A tiny, unidentifiable vehicle is struggling in crashing waves, the angles and shapes of the waves of which mimic Hokusai's great waves, perhaps the most famous work of ancient art, and also a portrayal of human fragility against nature. The strangeness, the crystalline beauty, and the many details of the print I think makes us pay attention because we have seen so many images of melting icebergs and struggling polar bears that we are now to it. This demand for attention is furthered by the small scale of the of the image. So I know this is huge, the screen is huge, but the actual print is very small, like smaller than a regular book. Which is startling when you consider the monumentality of the scene it depicts. This smallness, I think, forces you to get closer, hoping to detect more. It is a reminder that many of the most pressing issues we face today, climate change, global pandemic, racial injustice, are so massive that you can no longer see. In order to see them again and to care, we need a different kind of vision, something more imaginative, more planetary, but also more intimate and personal a sort of vision that art can hopefully help us be found. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So I guess now we welcome Suzanne. Thank you. Um, as uh, Amy uh, said, I am a professor of 
art and history um, in the School of Art at UT. Um, but oddly, I'm the only one here who is not using images. So. <laughs> My apologies for that. That's <laughs> not, not uh, considered acceptable by some art historians. Um, and I just wanted to also uh, say before I make my remarks that I am going to have to leave directly afterwards because I have to get to another event uh, before five o'clock. So I apologize for that. <clears throat> um, so I am in the same discipline as um, our speaker, Tong Han, um, and my research does focus on China, although I feel like we're not really exactly in the, in the same field. Um, I don't specialize in modern art or contemporary art. I work in the 17th century, um, and I'm not particularly familiar with modern and contemporary art in Asia more broadly, um, or with the work of Asian American artists. Uh, I do teach, however, a class on the art of uh, China in the 20th and 21st century. So I teach some contemporary art, and I do this in part because I think there's a demand for it in the School of Art, particularly from the studio students who are always very interested in what's going on in the art world uh, globally. <clears throat> Susanna? Yes. Just a note, if you could somehow come a little bit into the mic, that would be great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, okay, so I, I, um, Chang Han uh, sent us an article that she had written, which I think probably has some of the same content as the exhibition catalog. Um, and there were some themes in there that came up that I felt like really resonated with me in terms of issues that I deal with in teaching about China. So I'm going to be focusing on China and not just on, on contemporary. Um, so there's a tendency in popular writing and thinking about China to accept the conceptualization of Chinese culture as continuous, as uninterrupted and monolithic throughout its history. Uh, but Chinese culture is actually far more uh, heterogeneous than many people perceive from its earliest periods weaving together different ethnic strands that originate from both within and outside the area that we think of as China today. Uh, for example, while many people are aware that there are more than one language in China, I don't think that most people realize that there are actually hundreds of languages uh, in China, many of them not mutually intelligible, and that kind of you know, indicates the um, ethnic complexity of Chinese culture. And as a side note, I would say that like the sort of drive toward homogenization in China and elsewhere is actually um, leading to the possibility that some of these languages could be lost. Some of them are quite endangered. So in framing discussions of Chinese history and culture, it's common to rely on periodization based on Meiji dynasties rather than on things like economic and social processes that do not always fit neatly within those blocks of time. Um, and also on center-periphery models that posit single cultural centers whose influence radiates out toward the borders of kingdoms or empires. So archeological evidence from the Neolithic period and the Bronze Age has recently shown that there were actually multiple um, centers of culture in China um, during this period, throughout the area of you know, what we think of as modern day China, that existed independently and interacted with one another, exchanging technologies and cultural forms. And so this creates a much more complex model of Chinese culture than um, used to exist. But I, I don't know if it really made its way into um, you know, the popular mind. Also, throughout Chinese history, one sees the introduction of new subject matters, artistic styles, and cultural forms into China from regions that are nearby and quite distant. Um, the most notable um, example is, of course, the introduction of Buddhism. Um, and this is often discussed in terms of assimilation 
uh, by the Han um, majority of China and then Sinicization of non-Chinese peoples. Turning to the subject of contemporary art, each time I teach this material, I really struggle with the decision of which artists and content to include. There's not really a canon of contemporary Chinese art, uh, which can be considered a good thing, but then it leaves it up to me to decide what I'm going to put in there. Uh, and in particular, uh, the tendency to exhibit and write on contemporary artists whose work draws on recognizably Chinese themes, which Professor Khan writes about, um, is one that I share, unfortunately. I always feel quite guilty about it, but I do in fact share it. Um, although it is not just pre-modern Chinese tradition that I tend to um, focus on, but multiple past artistic movements that include several that originate outside of the uh, boundaries of modern China, such as European academic painting, Impressionism, German Expressionism, and Socialist Realism. But um, I have to confess that I seldom include artists whose work is just entirely um, abstract. Um, I don't know why exactly. Perhaps I feel less confident speaking about it. So teaching this material has prompted me to think about some of the preconceptions and biases that viewers, collectors, gallery owners, and curators may bring to contemporary Chinese art. Uh, I'm certainly not the first person to note this either. Um, but just as many Chinese people's understanding of China's status among world powers and its relationship to the countries of Euro-America and to Japan is informed by the so-called century of humiliation. So that is the period between 1839 and 1949 when China um, fought and lost the Opium Wars and um, lost control over large portions of their territory at the hands of foreigners. Um, so similarly, many Americans still view China, I feel, primarily through the lens of anti-communism shaped by our own past experiences and perceptions. Um, China is often viewed in an essentialist manner um, as if its political and economic forms never really change. Um, but that is far from true. I think, you know, I, I, since the pandemic, I have subscribed to many, many podcasts, a number of them on contemporary China. And um, many of these are uh, discussing some of these issues about like how communist is China these days. I mean, certainly the government is still dominated by the Chinese Communist Party, but economically, um, the country is becoming increasingly capitalistic and entrepreneurial. Um, also questions about how communists are members of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, I was listening to a podcast on this subject recently that was quite fascinating, and a couple of scholars were talking about how um, membership in the Chinese Communist Party is often more about a group of shared practices than a shared ideology. Um, and you know, if you want to be politically active in China, you're probably going to be a member of the Chinese Communist Party. There's a very idealistic strain to it because you know people who want to like do something to kind of serve the country may be um, uh, encouraged to go in that direction. So what I often see among members of the viewing public, however, is an assumption that Chinese artists share a certain level of antipathy toward their government um, with Americans, uh, despite the fact that actually public polls in China show that most of the populace is overwhelmingly supportive of the national government. Um, and this is even true of highly educated uh, people in China that you know, we might expect uh, to be more quote unquote liberal. These assumptions, I think, lead us to interpret works of art by Chinese artists as quote unquote political uh, and critical of Chinese government actions and policies when the artists often themselves say they are not. Um, there may be an issue of vocabulary here in part because I think that the word political in 
English or in the United States has a very broad meaning. You can see people slinging it about all over the place these days um, in regard to all different kinds of issues that have nothing really to do with politics. Um, while in China, I, I believe, um, I haven't made a deep study of this, but I think that it's much narrower in its meaning. Uh, but a perception of a work as political by you know, viewers, by collectors, by gallery owners may make work more saleable and more exhibitable. Likewise, Westerners may assume that, um, you know, for instance, uh, Chinese women or Chinese feminists share similar goals with feminists in the West, but that's not necessarily the case. Chinese feminism can be quite different uh, in Western feminism. So in teaching research gallery representation and exhibition, there may be a bias toward Chinese artists whose work engages themes that we find compelling and that seem to echo public opinion about China and the West. The contemporary artist whose work seems to appeal the most to my students uh, is uh, Ai Weiwei, who is openly critical of the Chinese government in his writing, speech, and art. He's been detained, arrested, physically attacked, and now lives outside China, all of which increases his cachet in the art world. This isn't to denigrate Ai as an artist or as a person. His work is really innovative, uh, challenging, and I think his beliefs are really sincere. Um, but I think a large part of his allure is due to a sense that he shares values with Western viewers. Uh, and this raises the question of whether artists who are not perceived as participating in political or social critique in their work um, alongside those who cannot uh, easily be tied to earlier cultural traditions are not given the same level of attention by the art world and by scholars. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much to uh, Professor Tan for your stimulating talk on Global Asia's exhibition. My remarks today will focus on one piece in the collection and how it relates to broader discussions about religious images and icons in the contemporary world. As a professor of religious studies with an expertise in Theravada Buddhism, and a specialization in contemporary Buddhism in Thailand, I was particularly struck by Bing Kui Le's 1997 weaving called The Cross. Here we see two images woven together. The dominant image is that of the Buddha, with his eyes downcast and a hint of a smile. This is a common expression especially in images of the Buddha in the meditation pose, which signals, among other things, the supreme contentedness and bliss that comes with nirvana. Within this image, Yin Kui Le has brilliantly woven an image of Jesus on the cross. The crucifixion for many Christians, 
especially for Catholics in Southeast Asia, is the principal embodiment of Christian theology. It is the divine sacrifice. We have, therefore, two profoundly important religious images woven together, the Buddha's awakening and Jesus' suffering. They represent in their respective soteriologies the salvation of others. Din Quile's technique of weaving these two images together brings a fresh lens, I think, to the topic of religious syncretism and hybridity in religious studies. Decades ago, anthropologists debated the nature of Southeast Asian forms of Buddhism. Scholars agreed that Buddhism on the ground was made up of elements from Buddhism, Hinduism, and numerous local traditions, but they debated the interaction among these various elements. Some focused on how these separate elements were fused into a single holistic system, while others noted their distinctiveness and how they function to satisfy different needs. B.J. Turwill argued that these two perspectives on Southeast Asian religion reflect different points of reference. From the perspective of so-called popular Buddhism, one tends to see more syncretism, the blending of different religious practices into a complex whole. From the perspective of the elite Buddhist tradition, however, one tends to note the composite parts and in so doing, to separate authentic Buddhism from Brahmanism and animism. Today, many anthropologists use the language of hybridity rather than syncretism to highlight how the combined parts are never fully fused together. Patanaki Diyatsa, for instance, described the discursive shift in this way, quote, it cannot be denied that Thai religion, by and large, has maintained its complex syncretic outlook. However, it is argued here that the focal point for students and specialists should not be the harmonious continuities and transformations of a syncretic religious system, but rather the ruptures and breaks from its seemingly homogenous tradition." End quote. While Patana was correct to draw our attention to ruptures and breaks within instantiations of syncretism, it may also be fruitful for us to examine the dynamic nature of these constructs. Our gaze need not dwell on the ends of the spectrum, on either harmonious continuities or the ruptures and breaks. Rather, we can focus on the process and context that produce both the continuities and the breaks. As John Hutnick suggests, quote, hybridity is better conceived of as a process, end quote. And this is where Dean Quile's The Cross is really powerful. It simultaneously reflects harmonious continuities as well as ruptures and breaks. It provides us with an opportunity to reflect on the comparisons and contrasts between Buddhist and Christian soteriologies, on European imperialism and colonialism, on the history of Christianity in Vietnam, including periods of privilege as well as periods of persecution, on the experiences of Vietnamese refugees, and on the dynamic, complex, multi-layered nature of lived religion. As a scholar of contemporary Buddhism, this is a useful way for me to think about syncretism and hybridity in relation to religious images and icons. Whether we are looking at the Buddha's image on the bag of popcorn at Whole Foods, and I won't problematize the fact that the word crave is on here. <laughs> you can talk about that later if you want me to. Or a modern trimurthy with Jesus, Buddha, and Lord Krishna on the website of a US-based ashram, or Disney characters at a Buddhist temple in Chiang Mai, Thailand. My own research focuses precisely on the convergence of competing and complementary narratives and embodiments of spirit goddesses in Thailand. One of these spirit goddesses is Damanam Kwak. There are several different styles of contemporary non-clock images, 
So they all share the following characteristics. She's always dressed in trip tie, traditional Thai style clothing, and one or sometimes both of her hands is in the beckoning pose. The contemporary iconography of Nam Kwok directs our attention to the hybrid nature of her. She is at once a physical embodiment of one form of traditional Thai femininity, while simultaneously symbolizing globalization. While her clothing mark her as distinctly Thai, her pose closely resembles that of the enormously popular Maneki Neko, the beckoning cat of Japan that has become a global symbol for wealth and prosperity. In fact, statues of Nam Kwok and Maneki Neko are frequently placed close together at religious art markets and business shrine shelves. The beckoning hand gesture has become so popular in Thailand that some monks are photographed with this gesture for promotional materials, including temple displays and religious magazines. While the gesture is used in Thailand for various beckoning needs, including hailing a taxi or calling to a child, it has become a free-floating signifier for a particular kind of beckoning. It is an invitation to be linked with wealth and other meritorious blessings. Business owners across Thailand emplace images or prints of Nam Kwok on shelves or other hard surfaces near the front of their stores in order to facilitate sales. And here, actually, in Knoxville, if you go to Taste of Thai, you will see one of these at the entrance. Many of these owners make daily offerings of incense, soft drinks, especially red fanta, and sweets to her. And they chant a katha, a power-infused polyphrase, to procure blessings. How does today's discussion of syncretism and hybridity help us to understand Nam Kwok's place within contemporary Thai religion? First, it enables us to see the movement of her narratives and her embodiments as they travel in and out of religious and cultural spaces. Her stories circulate in mass market religious magazines and books, which place her biography and tales of power next to varied others from the famous monk Prat Siwanili and Dalmatikian Tong, a tree goddess, to Manak, a famous ghost, and King Chulalongkorn. Her icons and printed images similarly shift locations. Many originate in Thai temples, having been blessed by popular monks, but then subsequently move out of the so-called religious space and onto shelves within businesses and homes. These various placements construct different hybridities. When she is in place next to Menekineko, they collectively suggest globalization and global prosperity. When she is next to Rama V or King Jolonongkorn, they embody Thai nationalism and Thai progress. When situated next to Komontong, they reference dangerous power that can be harnessed to cultivate wealth and prosperity. And finally, when she is situated near or usually below a Buddha image, she taps into the enormous power of the Buddha and his authority. In addition to these characters, Nankwak also is found near shrines of other powerful female spirits. In Hua Hin, a large image of Nam Kwok sits within a 50-foot shrine to Jamatikian Tong, the tree spirit that many people believe grants wealth through the revelation of lottery numbers. In Bangkok, at a Chinese shrine for Jamat Wan In, the Mahayana Bodhisattva of Compassion, an image of Nam Kwok has been emplaced near the Bodhisattva, as has an image of King Chulalongkorn and Pra Siwali. Given the plurality of non Kwok associations, any idea of a single syncretistic combination fails to capture the enormous breadth of her varied religious, cultural, and political relations. She is, first and foremost, a prosperity goddess, 
who inhabits different spaces as her followers make different claims about her identity. Some stories and ritual placements highlight her connection to Buddhist notions of power, while others point to her tieness and her connection to King Jurelongon, and still others suggest her connection to globalization, global capitalism, and cosmopolitanism. The Global Asia exhibit in general, and then Quile's The Cross in particular, draws our attention to the varied and complex identities embedded within Asian art and Asian American art. Din Kui Lei's The Cross draws our attention to harmonious continuities as well as to ruptures and breaks. And it makes us see that hybridity is the norm rather than the exception. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Lori from Rebuti. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Tan very much for your fascinating talk on Global Asia. I also would like to thank uh, the organizing committee of Dr. Tan's visit to UT for, and also for inviting me to this panel. I'm not in the field of art, I'm in the field of uh, Japanese literature and culture. So as we examine the works of art featured in this exhibit in the public, academic, and interpretive context, I would like to speak from a position in the field of uh, Japanese studies in the humanities and social sciences at large. Today, I would like to discuss briefly some of the shifting images and the visual representations of modern Japan at the intersection of politics, economy, and culture in both the domestic context of Japan and in the, also in the Asian and global context. Dr. Tan's lecture and article on Global Asia is a fascinating analysis of various forms of transnational flows from Asia and the United States. In this Global Asia exhibit, the artworks, especially those by the Japanese and Japanese American artists, may be characterized by their border crossing, mobility, subversiveness, destabilizing the predominant ideas and images associated with Japan and Asia, as Dr. Tan discussed. At the same time, there are recurring images associated with Japan in this exhibit and in the larger discourse formed by the artists and other agents in the cultural industry and also the government. And these images are consumed by both domestic and global spectators and observers. There are some uh, problematic political implications in some of the images that recreate Japan and its relations with the neighboring Asian nations and the United States. Therefore, as viewers and consumers of artworks, our gaze must be examined alongside the gaze by the cultural industry, the media, and the Japanese government and other uh, global entities. To the domestic and foreign observers, images and perceptions of Japan in the 20th century have shifted from Japan as a military power in the 1930s and the 1940s to an economic power in the 1970s and 1980s to a soft power or cultural power since the 1990s as exemplified in the global circulation and consumptions of animation and manga, graphic novels. In these decades, Japan as a nation state expanded as an empire until 1945 collapsed and lost its colonies and territories in Asia, experienced atomic bombing by the US military, followed by post-war US occupation, reconstructed post-war Japan, and restored its global standing in politics, economy, and culture. In these eras, images of Japan have been associated with, on the one hand, 
the hypermasculinity of wartime uh, soldiers, corporate warriors, and the bureaucrats of Japan Inc. Or on the other hand, with femininity associated with high aestheticism and refinement. Although images of Japan as subhuman and superhuman uh, military or economic warriors have been prevalent outside Japan, the images of Japan created in Japan in relation especially to the U.S. have been those of an innocent child, emasculated man, or uh, virginal or sexualized women. As we can see in some visual and literary representations. Here are some images from the United States, but they are um, internalized and problematized uh, often in post-war Japan. So of course you see MacArthur and the Emperor Hirohito from 1945, um, and then um, that is a little geisha women on the palm, big palm of the United States. And then at the end of American occupation, now Japan is supposed to be on its own way um, uh, to pursue its uh, independence. So there's that little boy, uh, Japan. And uh, so these images of Japan as a little guy or a uh, boy or child um, have um, been repeated in Japan. So these are some images from Japan. So you see uh, Prime Minister uh, Nakasone beaten up by Reagan in the 1980s uh, because the U.S. demands Japan open its uh, bell for uh, U.S. automobile industry. Uh, but it, here Japan is seen as bullied by the United States. And then you see Prime Minister Kaifu again on, you know, like um, in this hand, large and hairy hand of the United States. And then during the uh, Gulf War, the, you see an image of Japanese uh, bureaucrats and the uh, businesses uh, subserviently supporting the U.S. military's uh, um, efforts um, you know, in the Gulf War. And then here, during the G7 summit, Japan is seen, the prime minister is seen as, a, again, a little guy uh, surrounded by other uh, dignitaries uh, from the West. But uh, in popular visual representations, we see contradictory positions that uh, create uh, Japan after 1945 as an innocent, small, and a passive victim. As Susan Napier has pointed out in her analysis of anime and manga, such as Grego Fireflies, and they began erasing Japan's aggressive imperial past in relation to neighboring Asian nations. Uh, these images have both continued and discontinued, beginning in the 1990s, after the birth of the uh, bubble economy in Japan. In the new millennium, the cultural industry, the media, and the government of Japan have capitalized on the expansive and explosive soft power of Japan's cool, cute, and playful aesthetics and culture. Today, Japan's aesthetics of popular goods and culture are widely distributed and consumed in both the domestic and global markets. Since 2000, Murakami Takashi, featured in this Global Asians exhibit, has been leading the production and marketing of Japanese cute aesthetics for global consumption through what he calls super flat art. As Murakami himself interprets his artworks, and scholars such as Dr. Tan, uh, Christine Yano and Nina Kong has explained super flat is an aesthetic that is characterized by the interplay of putatively pre-modern and pre-westernized Japanese artistic perspectives in forms, contemporary digital technologies, and animation and popular culture icons. Murakami's playful, cool, and cute artworks are, however, not separate from politics. For his exhibit in 2005 in New York, Murakami selected the title, The Little Boy, The Arts of Japan's Exploding Subculture. Little Boy is, as Dr. Tan explained, is a code name uh, for the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima in 1945 by the US military. Murakami also calls Japan a castrated nation state in reference to Article 9 of Japan's post-war constitution, which renounces war. But this constitution was written primarily by the US civilians under the Allied occupation of Japan and has been in effect since 1947 to today. By using his popular art forms as a site of Japan's infantilization, 
emasculation and feminization, Murakami reproduces and recirculates these images of Japan globally. Although uh, these infantilized images uh, may signify vulnerability, Japan's cute or cool is, uh, as Christine Yano explains, quote, a benign agent, the bomb of global pop art and culture, unquote. So Murakami's explicitly playful, cute, and commercial aesthetics may be interpreted as a mockery or parody, but it's also adopted as a strategy of the Japanese government to brand cool Japan for both economic and political benefits. For example, in 2008, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Tourism designated manga and anime figures Doraemon and Hello Kitty as Japan's ambassadors of cute. In 2017, the United Nations World Tourism Organization named Hello Kitty a new special ambassador of the International Year. So images of Japan as an infant, emasculated man or girl, in this case a mouthless, mute Hello Kitty, may indicate vulnerability and trivialize Japan. But at the same time, the Japanese government, the cultural industry, and artists such as Murakami situate Japanese popular culture as a site of the soft power that is resurrecting and elevating the nation's global standing in the new millennium. Furthermore, these recurring and uh, renewed images of infantilized, emasculated, and girlish Japan are not only economically profitable, but also effective in erasing the images and reality of the significant part modern Japan has played as an aggressive empire toward neighboring Asian nations. So in conclusion, as we discuss artworks of global Asia, we recognize forms and aesthetics that cross geographical borders, transcend national and ethnic boundaries, and destabilize the uh, predominant ideas and images associated with Japan and Asia. And yet, at the same time, we also find the fervor of a new large-scale nationalism of Japan in the aesthetics of the infantilized and playful in its popular artworks and culture, which have been circulated for global consumption since 1945 and into the new millennium. Thank you very much. Thank you for those wonderful presentations. We're running along, and so what I thought maybe we could do is just have a moment with the four of you where we, you could um, perhaps discuss overlaps or things that you're seeing in the presentation, what you're taking from this overall event, just uh, maybe five minutes or something to just summarize our, our presentation together. Would that be all right? If there are any questions, okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer. If not, I'll do some summary. Um, for Nariko, oh my goodness, I bring the mic. <laughs> Hi, awesome talk, guys. Um, for Nariko, I was wondering what if you had any insights on the kind of Western obsession with anime and how um, Asian women have thus become super sexualized due to um, the way that they're portrayed in that and how it's like very common in a Western sphere. Sure. All right. So we have another suggestion that we take all the questions at once and then we can answer them together. Um, do we have other questions? Um, thanks for wonderful presentations. And I think what you did is unpack a lot of the complexities in global Asia as plural. But I was really interested in Cheng's point about the tensions that 
art, art association heritage have between drawing on their traditions and also representing and assimilating to Western traditions. And I think that's also played out in different aspects of the exhibit. So I think that would be an interesting thing to discuss. Um, so. Okay, and I'm going to add one more actually of my own, which is that um, you started this presentation, Chang, with a, a note about the artificiality of the term global ages. Um, and I was wondering if we could sort of circle around when we see such different presentations here, we could circle around to that idea what we what we gain by putting everything together in this kind of conversation. Your question. <laughs> so first, I'm very grateful to your presentations and your solid uh, research-based, you know, talks that I've learned so much from. So I hope to hear more about both of your research as well. So for the questions, uh, the base question, and I think this question, some of the MFA students here probably have even more kind of a first person experiences and more thoughts about this very question than I do. Um, but and I've heard a lot from them already. But I think this is kind of this tension is of course originating from this false binary we have in our mind that you know there's this Asian identity versus this Western identity and the two somehow we're standing on the opposite side of the spectrum, which I would say, you know, that's something even it was Saeed has argued many decades ago, that was really uh, very much a fabrication from the Orientalist perspective, that these two types of identities, if they mix, then they have to conquer a lot of obstacles in order to mix. And I think these obstacles do exist, and they exist. The reason they exist is not because these two traditions are somewhat, you know, naturally in conflict with each other. It's just because of our, our perceptions that if you mix these two things, you must be struggling and trying to, you know, kind of repress one side in order to boost the other. And I think that's a false binary, and it's a false assumption you have here. And I think what you know, Rachel, you put so beautifully at the end of your presentation that hybridity is not the exception, but the norm. I think that's really what we should keep in mind. It's really, if you look at every aspect of our material culture, it's a result of hybridation or hybridity and mixture that sometimes we are not even aware of. Just, you know, starting from the materials of everything we built to the technology techniques of the people who contribute, contributed to the building of things, to the use, and as well as, of course, the visual culture, every aspect of our visual culture is already mixed beyond our recognition. And so that's a norm, you know, that we should try to keep that in mind, whether we're dealing with art or other aspects of uh, humanities. So that's, I think that's my part of the answer, maybe. And that's, yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, thank you very much for that question about uh, manga and anime and how uh, women are depicted and sexualized. So, of course, uh, you know, that's a valid point. Uh, shoujo or women uh, or young women have often been de depicted that way, right? And uh, sexualized, exploited for uh, economic benefits and profits and so on. So, on the other hand, um, there are, if you look at the authors of uh, manga, anime, they're all women writers and uh, producers and so on. And they sometimes depict, um, you know, these shoujo, right? Uh, again, women or young girls, but those who are not uh, uh, before marriage, uh, marriage or wifehood or motherhood. And they uh, try to depict this homo sort of gender relations among women, right, for their friendship and then uh, in their private world, right? And in that, there may be some focus on their innocence and purity, but then this 
when it's uh, circulated for consumption, uh, it becomes part of, part of the public discourse, and then it's uh, often sexualized by the consumers and viewers and so on. So there is that problem too. So, uh, but you may have more thoughts and uh, uh, ideas about this. Yeah. That's what I can say right now. The only thing I would add um, to talking about hybridity, I think that was something that, that all of us touched on, and Suzanne touched on that as well, is movement, right? It's flow. And um, just as I would say, hybridity um, is, is the norm and not the exception, so is movement, right? And, um, you know, whether we're looking at, you know, Asian art or Asian American art in the Americas, or we're looking at the cultural flow going back, um, which is, of course, um, what I'm very much interested in as somebody who's an ethnographer um, of Southeast Asia, I just, I'm, I'm just always fascinated by it and by creativity and by the ability um, to question. And I think we see that in this exhibit and it just beautifully in so many different ways. <laughs> so it just kind of feels like this whole panel was curated for me. Um, so I'm biracial, I'm Japanese and white. And when you say like hybridity is the norm, it's so important that I just wonder what you would say to me then when I feel very real feelings of discomfort and not being able to fit in into certain places. How do you approach hybridity when there's a society that so clearly does not want that to be the norm? Um, let me try and answer that. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Sorry, that's a big heavy question. It is a big heavy question. Um, I, mean, I think that's true for all of us, right? And um, I think the power of creating borders and demarcations is a really, really powerful force in our world, right? Um, as I say to my students all the time, that there's no construction of the self without the construction of the other. And so I think, unfortunately, um, for individuals who kind of, quote unquote, feel like they don't fit in because they're not in some kind of little box, um, that kind of hybrid identity is otherized, right? Um, and 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 be problematic. Let me see if one of my esteemed colleagues wants to say something more. Okay. I mean, I just want to say that you know, he said that we don't want to recognize. It's a society that might be the case to some degree, but it's changing. And I think the mixed race population in the US is the fastest growing group right now. And um, it's and if you look at pop culture, <laughs> as I did last night when I was watching TV in my hotel room, <laughs> like now nowadays the commercials, they use you know mixed race models more than any other. <laughs> Race. And you see so many more like dark skinned and mixed race like actors and actresses on popular culture. And that's obviously we're not saying that that's like the you know the sign of real change, but it is something. Okay. And then if you think about how the LB, you know, LGBTQ like society, that group community became accepted in mainstream, they kind of started with this culture, the turn of culture trend. And I, I'm not, I don't think like that will reach a perfectly harmonious society in which every member of it is treated equally. That's like a utopian vision. But on the other hand, I think things are looking up for hybridity. <laughs> and just because globalization is unavoidable and you really, you know, I think people are accepting that. And that's one of the consequences of globalization, I would say that's probably the best consequence of globalization. There are many other downsides, but hybridity is the best part. So, and I think that's you know what the exhibition is about as well, right? Fluid, 
fluidity, rigidity, and this is something that is beautiful and should be celebrated. So I'm going to give them the stop sign. Thank you very much for attending today. Thank you. Could you join me in a round of applause for this extraordinary